I've recently started watching the uh, the medical drama, The Good Doctor, which, if you um, if you don't know, it follows this young doctor named Sean Murphy as he goes through his surgical residency, and and I'm assuming a few years after that residency, I haven't gotten that far yet. Um, but Dr. Murphy has autism and and savant syndrome which while causing him some difficulties in some things actually makes him an incredibly competent surgeon and there, there are these moments in in the show regularly where where dr murphy sees something or he recognizes something that everybody else missed he has this unique ability to see the evidence that others miss and then, and then to bring all of that evidence together, to tie it in with his photographic memory and to discover the truth. Even when everybody else thinks something different, he looks at the evidence. We might say that he listens to the testimony, the testimony of the, the patient's body and all of the tests that they've run and what the monitors are saying. And he comes to believe the truth. And then this is what happens. He believes the truth and everything changes because now he begins to live in light of the truth. Right? So his response to this patient changes. And in episode after episode, we find Dr. Murphy discovering victory over death and over disease, episode after episode. Well, that process, applied biblically, is a good summary of, of our text this morning, which seems to say, hey, the evidence is loud and clear, and when we listen to the testimony, the truth becomes obvious. And when we believe the truth, everything changes. We are changed, fundamentally changed, granted victory so that we can begin to live in love and obedience. And of course, the, the victory that Dr. Murphy is giving people is just momentary victory, right? One day they will die. We will all die. But the victory that is found in Jesus is eternal, eternal life, eternal victory as we live in eternal love. It's, it, that difference in, in momentary and eternal victory, it's what caused the Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones to leave medicine and become a preacher of, of the gospel. I don't know if you know about him. I think I've talked about him before. Lloyd-Jones was a successful physician in England about 100 years ago. Um, but he found himself in this conflict that when he had cured someone, when he had healed the sick, they would just go out and start sinning again. They would go out and start killing themselves again, living lives of destruction again. He realized that the hope that he was offering was just a temporary hope. And so he left the operating room and he moved into the pulpit where he could offer eternal hope and victory found in Jesus. And this is what he said when he was reflecting back on that. He said, as doctors, we spend most of our times rendering people fit to go back to their sin. I saw uh, men on their sick beds. I spoke to them of their immortal souls. They promised grand things. And then they got better and went back to their old sin. And I saw that I was helping them to sin. And I decided that I would do no more of it. I want to heal souls. If a man has a diseased body, but his soul is all right, then he's all right, all the way to the end. But a man with a healthy body and a diseased soul is all right for 60 years or so, but then he has to face an eternity of hell. And so this morning, as we look at our text in 1 John, we're going to be encouraged to do what, what Dr. Murphy has done, but to do it thinking about it like Dr. Lloyd-Jones which is to say we're, gonna, we're not doing it in regards to momentary afflictions, but we want to do this in terms of eternal afflictions. The process, the progress is this. So if, you wanna, if you're taking notes, here it is in a sentence. The evidence is clear. And the evidence that we're going to look at results in believing the truth. And believing the truth results in life and victory. And victory produces love and obedience. That's the progression. You'll see it as we go on together. But let's consider our text together this morning from 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 
to 12. If you have your Bible with you, you can go ahead and, and turn there. If you picked up one of these Bibles on your way in, which I know several of you did, it's on page 1,125. You can turn there. And let me just also remind you, these Bibles that we put out every week, they're there for you. We have extras. We'll bring more. So if you don't have a Bible of your own, please take it with you. We want you to have a copy of God's Word. Let me read for us now from 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 to 12. It says this. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he is born concerning his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has, does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his Son. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. Okay, the core, the core of what it means to be a Christian is to believe in, to have faith in Jesus, the Christ, the son of God. The central message of Christianity is that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Remember that that conversation that Jesus has with his disciples? Where Jesus looks at them and he says, hey, who do people say that I am? Right? And, and, and they say, well, some people say that you're John the Baptist, and some people say that you're Elijah, and some people say that you're, you're one of the other prophets. And so then Jesus looked at them and he said, okay, who do, who do you say that I am? Right? That's the central question of Christianity. Who do you say Jesus is? is. It's not just for the disciples. It's not just for preachers. It's for all of us. Who do you say? Who do you believe Jesus is? And, and Peter, who's there, never at a loss for words, Peter says, hey, I know who you are. I know who you, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus' response to him is to say that you're blessed Because this has been revealed to you by God himself. And I'm going to build my eternal church on that truth, on that reality that I am the Christ, the son of the living God. Well, standing there with Jesus and Peter was this guy named John. Who now, 60 years later, wrote the book of 1 John. And he says there in verse 1, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And then in verse 5, he says, who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? The central truth of Christianity is that, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. The biblical scholar David Jackman says we need to be perfectly clear. That whatever else a person may claim to believe or whatever other position they may hold, if a man or woman does not believe that Jesus is the Son of God, he or she cannot have been born of God and cannot be called a Christian. That's the truth. 
And it's the truth that brings life and victory. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Okay, so just, just real quick, let's talk about what that means. Okay, to say that he is the Christ is to say that he is the anointed one of God. That's what the word means. It's what the word Christ means. In the, in the Old Testament, the Hebrew, that's the word Messiah. In the New Testament, in the Greek, it's the word Christ. But they both mean, they all mean the same thing. They mean the anointed one. So he's the anointed one of God. And biblically speaking, there are three groups of people who are anointed. They're the prophets, the priests, and the kings. And we're not just saying that Jesus is a anointed one. He's not a Christ or a Messiah. He's the Christ, the anointed one, the, the superior and ultimate prophet, priest, and king. Right? So his, his word can be trusted as truth because he is the prophet of God. And, and his sacrifice can be trusted as, as adequate and final because he is the high priest of God. And his reign can be trusted as good and it will last forever because he is the king. He's the Christ. Right? But, but, but the confession doesn't stop there. He is the Christ. He is the Son of God. Which, according to Scripture, means that he himself is God. He has the authority, the, the power of God. He's equal with God. In fact, that's why the Jews kept trying to stone Jesus. Because Jesus would claim God as his father, and then they'd pick up stones to kill him. And this is why, because when he claimed God as his father, he claimed to be equal with God. He was claiming to be God. Okay, so just think about what all of that means then. He's, he's the Christ. He's the son of the living God. What does that mean functionally in our life? Right? It's easy to say those sorts of things. What does that mean? Well, to believe it, right, isn't just to say it. It's to live in light of it. In fact, that's why right after Peter confesses that, do you know what the next thing Jesus says to him is? But he calls him blessed. He says, God showed you this. He said, I'm going to build my church upon this. And the next thing Jesus says to him is, get behind me, Satan. The next thing he says is, Peter, you're, you're fixing your eyes on earthly things and not heavenly things. You believed it enough to say it, but you didn't believe it enough to live it. And now I'm recognizing that that belief hasn't sunk in to who you actually are. Are. Your eyes are not, your heart is not fixed on the things of God. And so it is with us so often. We believe it enough to say it, but we need to live in light of it. The central belief that Christians live in light of, the central belief that our lives are ordered around is that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's, that's what we order our lives around. So we listen to him and accept it as true. We trust in his sacrifice and his sacrifice alone. We live in obedience to him because he is our king. But the question we might ask is this. Okay, but why would I believe that? If, if that's the central belief, give me some evidence. And this is where our text actually does. It says, hey, the evidence is actually very clear. Let's look at the evidence. Look at verses 6 to 9 just to see what it says. It says, this Jesus, Jesus is he who came by water and blood, right? Jesus Christ, not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. Okay, so there are three that testify. The Spirit and the water and the blood. And these three agree. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he is born concerning his son. Okay, why would you believe it? Why would you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God? Our text says there's three reasons we should believe it. We should believe it because of the testimony of God, right? That's verse 9. We believe the testimony of men. How much more should we believe the testimony of God? But what is the testimony of God? Three things, the water, the blood, and the spirit. Let me take that out of the abstract for us. He's talking about the baptism of Jesus, 
the crucifixion of Jesus, and the sending of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost specifically. He says, God has spoken to us about who Jesus is in these three things. His baptism, his crucifixion, and the sending of the Spirit. So just think about those. When Jesus was baptized, you may remember this story. We're told that as he came up out of the water, that the heavens opened up and the Spirit of God descended on him like a dove and the voice of the Father basically shouts forth from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son. In him I am well pleased. And John the Baptist, the guy who's doing the baptism, he says that God actually told him ahead of time God told me ahead of time that the person who that happens to, that's the one that's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit. And he says, and that's the reason that I know that he is the Son of God. Because the water bears testimony. His baptism bears testimony. How do you know that Jesus is the Son of God? Here's some evidence. God spoke from heaven and said, that's my Son. That's pretty good evidence to the fact that he is the Son of God of God, right? But it's not just the water. The blood bears testimony as well. The crucifixion of Jesus is not just a powerful moment for our salvation. It's a powerful moment in in testifying to who God is, to who Jesus is. Did you know that when Jesus died on the cross, the sky becomes dark in the middle of the day for three hours. Daytime becomes nighttime in the middle of the day for three hours. And then the moment that he died, an earthquake came. An earthquake so powerful, in fact, that it opens up graves that were previously closed up, and the people who were in those graves got up and walked out at the crucifixion of Jesus, at the moment that he died. Victory begins in the graveyard. The moment that he died in the temple, the curtain that divided and separated men from God was torn in two so that we wouldn't have to be separated from God any longer. And then here's what happens. It's amazing thing happens. Matthew 27, 54 says this, when the centurion the person who who nailed him to the cross, the person overseeing this execution, when the centurion and those who were with him keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and they said, truly, this was the Son of God. When his enemy saw what happened at his death, he said, he's the Son of God. That's the one thing I know is he is the son of God. The blood of Jesus bears testimony to the truth that he is the Christ, the son of God. And then finally, the sending of the, of the spirit bears testimony as well. Jesus told his disciples, he says, I'm going I'm to leave you and I'm going to go to the father. And when I get to the father, I'm going to ask the father to send another comforter to be with you. I'm going to ask the Father to send the Holy Spirit to dwell with you, to dwell in you. That's what I'm going to ask for. And then Jesus ascended into heaven. And and, and what happened? Well, 10 days later, the Spirit of God came with power upon the followers of Jesus. And the Spirit of God has been coming in power on the followers of Jesus ever since that moment up until today, testifying to the truth that Jesus actually went to the Father and that the Father actually listened to the Son because the Spirit was in fact sent. And what did the Spirit do when the Spirit came? The Spirit's work is all about glorifying Jesus, making much of Jesus, has been testifying in our spirits day after day after day that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. The water, the blood, and the Spirit, they all agree. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And when we believe that truth, something happens in us. Our text says when we believe that truth, we are born again. That's verse 1. 
born again to eternal life. That's verse 11. Granted victory over the world. That's verse 4. Believing the truth brings life and victory. We are born again, born to eternal life. The evidence is clear. He's the Christ, the Son of the living God. When we believe the truth, everything changes. And at some point, y'all are going to get tired of me talking about this, but I, I can't think actually of anything more important than for us to understand that, that when we repent and believe in Jesus, something radical happens in us. So, so radical, in fact, that when Scripture talks about it, it uses such extreme language that we can't even really comprehend what it's talking about. That's that, that concept of being born again. That's a radical idea, to be completely born again, to be brought from death to, to life to have a new spiritual family, to have a new spiritual DNA. Our DNA has been changed. We've been transferred, we're told, from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of of the Son of God, to the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Everything changes. And if everything hasn't changed, or more specifically, if things haven't changed, if you're saying to yourself, well, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, But when you look at your life and you say, I've been believing that for five years and nothing has changed, then I would begin to wonder whether or not you've actually believed it. If your passions aren't changing, if your desires aren't changing, if your your impulse to help others isn't, isn't expanding, if your capacity to forgive isn't extending, if your willingness to repent isn't growing, if nothing is changing except for your plans a few Sunday mornings a month, then I have to wonder whether you've actually been born again. But if you have been, if you have been really born again, then you are born into a life that is full and, and abundant and eternal. You've been brought into a life that is shared between the Father and the Son and the Spirit, and now you've been brought into that life. A life that offers peace even in the midst of chaos. Joy even in the midst of, of suffering and hope even in the midst of despair. And again, right, when the Bible talks about this, it uses extreme language that makes it kind of hard to understand. It says things like when when this happens to us, we can know the love of God that's beyond knowledge. What? It says we're going to be guarded by a peace from God that is beyond our understanding. It uses this this wild, extreme language as if to say that the life that we find in God truly is better than anything else we could ever imagine. In other words, we're we're invited into, we're born into. When we we believe in Jesus, we're born into a life that is so full, so full of, of goodness, so full of the presence of God that we can't even explain it. We can just worship God because of it. Born again to eternal life. Granted victory over this world. Earlier, we sang that the victory belongs to Jesus. And then we sang that we have victory in Jesus. Right? The victory that overcomes the world. Our text says that it's our, it's our faith. The world only has power over us when we believe that the world has something to offer us. But when I truly believe that all I have and all I need comes to me in Jesus, then I have victory over the world. The way Pastor John Piper puts it is this. He says, faith sees that Jesus is better. That's why faith conquers the world. The world held us in bondage by the power of its desires, but now our eyes have been opened by the new birth to see the superior desirability of Jesus. Jesus is better than the desires of the flesh, better than the desires of our eyes, and better than the riches that strangle us with greed and pride. Colossians 2.15 says that Jesus has disarmed the rulers and authorities of this world, and he has put them to an open shame by triumphing over them. He has the victory. 
And then he shares that victory with all who repent and believe in him. When, when we believe the truth that he is the Christ, the Son of God, we are born again to eternal life. We're granted victory over the world and the systems of the world. But there's one more change that we need to see here in our text. One more thing that we want to see. It's the outcome of that faith. It's also the evidence of that faith. The outcome of our faith, the lived evidence of our faith is love and obedience. Look at verses 2 and 3. It says, By this we know that we love the children of God. When we love God and obey his commandments, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. The book of Ecclesiastes is really written to demonstrate the futility of of the world. The preacher, the writer in the book, he tries out all the things that the world has to offer. He says, at the end of it all, they're all futile. They're all ultimately worthless. And then at the very end of the book, he, he says this. He says, the end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. That's what, that's what John says. Love God, keep his commandments. And then John adds this kind of ridiculous thought to us. He says his commands are not burdensome. His commands are not, it's not hard to do that. They're not burdensome to us. Jesus reminds us that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. To love God with every part of who you are. And then he says, and the second is like it. It's to love your neighbor as yourself. And then he says, all of the commandments are fulfilled in these two. If we truly love and believe in Jesus, well, of course, of course we would obey his commandments. And that's why, that's why his commandments aren't burdensome. They aren't burdensome because they're obeyed out of love and faith. The, the commandments of Jesus are only burdensome in the world's system. The world's system tells me that I'm supposed to gather and keep as much money and power and respect and authority as possible. It tells me to have as much pleasure and happiness and satisfaction as possible. Well, in that system, the commands of Jesus are burdensome. In that system, I will not be generous or kind or loving. I won't admit when I'm wrong. I won't seek peace or forgiveness. I'll never deny myself. In the world system, I live for myself, and I only live for others when it actually benefits myself. And in that system, the commands of Jesus will be very burdensome. But for for us who have believed in Jesus, for for those who believe that he is the Christ, the Son of God, we have been born again, and we have been granted victory. Our faith has given us victory over the world. So that means that now we're set free from the system of the world. And so the commands of Jesus are not burdensome. Rather, they're, they're a delight. Living a life of of, of sacrifice and and service and love, a life of of denial and self-control and moderation, it's not a burden. It may be a challenge, but it's not a burden. Not for those who are in Christ, not for those who have victory over the world. Love and obedience are the family traits of the children of God. Love and obedience are the cultural norms of the kingdom of God. So if we're living for our family, and we're living for our culture, our true family and our true culture, these aren't burdensome. But love and obedience, and I think this is important to hear, love and obedience won't get us to God. Only believing in Jesus will do that. But the core of Christianity is believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. That's the core. And when we believe the core, when we believe the truth, when we look at the evidence and believe the truth, everything changes. We're born again. We're granted victory. And then we, then we begin to live in love and obedience.
And so my challenge for us today is that we would examine our hearts and our lives. And this is, I think, the the first question to to ask is, do I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God? And and if not, if not, then, then I would encourage you, then you don't have to worry about the rest of these questions. Rather, look at the evidence. Consider the evidence of who he is. Consider what he has done for you. But if you do believe, then then let me ask this. Are you living in light of that belief? Do you believe it in concept or in in reality? Are you living as one who's been born again? Are you living as one who has victory over the world? And, And if we're honest, I think that all of us have to answer in some ways no to at least some of those questions. But the goal today is not condemnation. Rather, it's that we would remember. That's actually why we come together. We come together every week to remember. To remember that Jesus is the Christ. To remember that he's the Son of God. To remember that he died on the cross to forgive us. To remember that he set us free from our sins. To remember that he was buried, but three days later he rose again. To remember that he won victory over death and sin. And to remember that he then shared that victory with all who turn to him, all who trust in him. In him we are born again. We're the children of God. We're set free. Set free to love one another as he has loved us. So my encouragement is consider these questions and then remember. Remember who he is. Remember what he's done. And remember who you are. Who you are in him. Remember. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the way you have patterned our lives and our weeks to have an opportunity to remember. That you you did that even in the giving of the commands. When you gave your command to keep the Sabbath day and to keep it holy, you did it so we would remember. So we would remember your great love for us. And so, Lord, we, we pray that you would help us to remember. And Lord, at the same time, we, we pray that, that, you, would, that you would give us the, the strength, the, the courage, the, the boldness to take our beliefs out of the concept and into reality. That it would change the ways we live our lives. That if you truly are who you say you are, if you truly are who Scripture says you are, well, then we can begin to live in victory. We can begin to live in love and obedience. And Lord, that will not be burdensome. And so we ask, Lord, that you would help us. Help us today. Help us every day. Lord, to remember and to worship you and to live in love just like you. In Christ's name, amen.